Hey folks, uh, I think this thing is working. I was doing some testing of my sort of audio video setup on the computer and I thought, you know, maybe I'll just put together a quick uh, video on a few questions uh, that I've gotten over the last few weeks, uh, maybe now even a couple months ago. Um, in this particular case, just about vacuum. So I spend a fair amount of time, people know, my kind of one of my hobbies. I've done for, uh, I don't know, a couple decades now. Yeah, it's been that long. Uh, is just answering questions uh, in various forms. You know, Slack, probably the number one place now uh, in different Slack teams that I'm in, uh, but other places as well. In any case, uh, so, you know, vacuum, always a hot topic in the Postgres world. Uh, and so there were a few interesting questions that I've gotten over the last couple months um, that uh I thought, you know, I, I, there's some good stuff coming out or on the circuit now, as they say, uh, people doing talks on vacuums and blog posts. Um, but even still, like, I feel there's there's missing gaps in there. Uh, and I do sort of have it on my to-do list, not super high, I'll be honest, uh, of getting a, a vacuum talk out there and, and sort of talking about managing vacuum. I know there's a lot of them. Like I said, I still think there's gaps. So for now, let me shoot a few questions out there and sort of my thoughts on those those questions and the answers that I've given to folks on Slack. Uh, and I'll try to sum those up and, and hopefully that will prove useful to folks. Uh, and we'll just kind of see where that goes. Um, so the first one uh, and just uh, not any particular order necessarily, although this one was kind of interesting at the end of the conversation, uh, the person who mentioned like, hey, you should do like a video on explaining vacuum and how this stuff is supposed to work. Uh, and so maybe that that kernel has been sitting in the back of my uh, my head, uh, the seed in today is it, it sprouts, I suppose. Um, but the question that was originally asked was, uh, hey, I'm seeing high CPU on a Postgres RDS instance after upgrading from 11.14 uh, 11 to 14.6. Uh, while investigating, I found a query going for a parallel plan, and I'm kind of curious about tuning max parallel worker as a max parallel process. So uh, that doesn't sound like it's going to jump into uh, a vacuum related thing, but uh, as it turned out, uh, I, I guess let me start with a few different things. So I'll start with the idea that the they're saying, like, I've seen this new plan, now it's doing parallelization, uh, and I think I need to tune the max parallel stuff. Um, I'll start with saying that I think we have woefully inadequate sort of documentation and primers on how best to tune the parallel worker stuff uh, that is in Postgres. Um, and, you know, again, that's another one on my to-do list. Like, I'd love to do that, but honestly, like, I would have to research it much more so than I have. Uh, as a general rule, coming from the consulting background, you know, I've I've said to the folks on my teams and, and clients that I've had, um, if you have the time, it's great to go spend in there. But like, it's it's a world without a lot of guidance, and there's not a lot of light on there. Uh, and I usually find there's other places you can go after, and and sort of make a, an easier and better performance improvement on the system as a whole. Um, so in that case, uh, where I kind of led this person down, um, and I actually started with just kind of saying that, like there is no real best practice on this at the moment. Uh, it's sort of unfortunate, but that's where we are. Um, so I, I first started to sort of say like, hey, this is this a you know performance regression? Like is it a different plan? Can you go back and look at what was going on on the 11 system versus the 14 system? Uh, and uh, you know, it sort of compare those plans uh, and make sure that certain parameters like default statistics target haven't been changed anywhere. Um, you know, and and then that sort of led us to questions about, well, can those change during a version upgrade? You know, and it's, you know, obviously depends on how you do your version upgrade. In the RDS world, uh, it's unlikely but not impossible. Certainly if you have changed it, on your system, and this is true in any world, really, if you change on your system and you just take what comes as the defaults for your packager or your cloud provider or whatever, those may not be the same, right? That, that upgrade process uh, that RDS automates for you and most upgrade processes that people do, it's not like there's anything that goes and looks at your old settings and then converts them over into the new version, uh, for better or worse, right? Like sometimes that's a good thing, sometimes it can be a bad thing. And it'd be kind of tricky to know, which is why I think most of those processes kind of, you know, they punt that to the DBA. Um, and 
so I just, you know, I mentioned a few different things like, well, if you've done a lot of tuning on the system, you know, just first off, just check the default statistics target. Make sure that is correct. You've done an analyze on everything. If you're seeing weird performance after an upgrade, um, there's a little uh, mention in the PG upgrade output uh, that says like, hey, there's going to be some stuff right into a file that you need to do. Uh, so please look at that file and do what the file tells you. I think it's like step 14 in the 20 point process of what PG upgrade is telling you. Uh, and in that file that it writes out, it basically is like saying, Hey, you should run a vacuum and analyze. Uh, if you're doing this in RDS in particular, I've noticed like this is buried, uh, you know, even that those notifications, which a lot of people overlook running PG upgrade manually, uh, they're buried in a window that you don't generally even see in RDS. So, uh, so you really have to, like, that's one of the first things I always check is, like, after upgrade, if you're seeing weird stuff with performance, make sure you've done the vacuum and the analyze stuff. Uh, make sure your default statistics target is correct. And also, if you're unsure, uh, one of the things that we would check um, would be, you know, make sure nobody has done uh, alter statistics uh, for an individual table, right, or individual columns, because um, that can... can you know, that can easily get lost uh, along the way if you're not aware that that has happened. Um, and it's not necessarily obvious that, like, some table may have been modified as you're looking through different windows, like whether you're in PSQL or whatever. Uh, that that information wouldn't necessarily jump out at you. So, uh, you know, look in, and let's look in the system tables. You can find that information. That That's pretty easy to find online, how to figure that out. Um, if you... Now, the other side of that coin is, so now you've got a parallelization thing going on uh, and you're not sure if that's the right answer. Um, before you just blank turn off parallelization, I know some people have done that. That's not necessarily what I would recommend. I might also say, go look at, maybe now you should change this. If you hadn't done it before, maybe now you actually want to do it for certain columns where your parallelization is kicking off where you don't think it's needed. Uh, and so that was sort of another hint. Uh, I kind of wish it was easier to do that at the individual table level. Uh, Postgres really has set that up to do that at the column level in a table. Um, but I think, it, to me, like it would be easier. I, I sort of feel like if there's one column, this is not really true, but it, it feels like I'm, I want to be lazy. If there is a column in a table where I feel like the statistics target should be changed and would improve the state of things, I probably would like to just do it for the whole table as an initial go around. And then any queries on that table get, usually I'm bumping it up, so they get more statistics information. Um, so uh, that's not really how Postgres does it. Hey, feature request. Um, but you can do, uh, you know, uh, alter table and change that for a particular column. Uh, if you just want to test it, I mean, you can do it in a session. Set your default statistics target equal to whatever new thing it is, run queries on the table, and it'll stay for the life of the session. Uh, that can cause an issue, though, obviously. Like, once the session is over, you have to figure out how you're going to really set that. So, <coughs> excuse me. Um, anyway, so that, you know, just sort of the reminder um, of statistics targets uh, and vacuum analyze and how that analyze activity interplays with upgrades. Uh, it's sort of an important piece just to keep that in mind. And again, make sure if you're doing that on an individual column basis uh, for specific tables, specific queries, make sure you capture that when you do an upgrade. So that was sort of the first question that, that sort of got me down this path. Um, the next one was an interesting one. And this actually followed more of a discussion uh, that happened. And I, I came to it kind of late. This was on Slack. Uh, the Postgres team Slack, uh, in fact. Uh, and one of the interesting things about the Postgres team Slack, some of these other Slack teams I'm in, people ask a question. And, uh, you know, I, I might be one of the few people who would answer it on the Postgres team Slack. You get certainly many more people will chime in. Uh, usually that is a good thing. Occasionally we have to sort of explain that the answer given isn't the right one. But by and large, um, you know, it's a good thing to have more people to answer. So there was a discussion on this one, and, and I'll give you the question, which was, you know, I have a question regarding auto vacuum. Um, the cost settings, which were cost of limit and cost delay, were recently tweaked for a database with very large multi-terabyte tables, and auto vacuum had kicked off around that same time. And I'd like to know if the currently running auto vacuum process is using the old settings or the new settings. Is there a way to tell? Uh, they were running on uh, Postgres 15.2 in Cloud SQL, which is the Google 
uh, Postgres as a service thing. Um, so they don't have access to the file system if that were to make a difference. Uh, I, I think that the TLDR um, and the, the first answer that was given, you know, one of these, uh, man, after my own heart, a uh, guy by the name of uh, VJ uh, Coomer Jane, uh, and he mentioned, like, well, if you had access to the file system, you could attach with GDB to the process and, you know, go poking around and you could most likely figure that out. Um, but otherwise, uh, there's not really a good way. It's not terribly visible to see which set of settings is going on in the system. Um, another nice little answer that, that came in that discussion, uh, Greg Sabina Mullane had pointed out in version 16, uh, which is right around the corner, um, that has there's a, a change in there so that auto vacuums will pick up new settings like that on the fly even while they're running uh, which is really great because that has always been sort of a point of contention like do i kill this thing do i let it keep going you know uh and in this case the the person had mentioned like hey we're doing multi-terabyte tables uh and in the discussion they point out that like hey these are taking like days at a time for these things to run um I think on average it was about five days to get through one of these multi-terabyte tables and the latest one uh, was about two days in. So when you know it's that long, you know, you really hate to sort of kill it just to like, well, I don't know if it did. So if I kill it and restart it, I guess, you know, the auto vacuum, um, I guess I can be sure that it has picked it up. But uh, boy, that, you know, you're killing like two days of effort. Uh, and the other thing that could be an issue is, especially when you're talking these days at a time auto vacuum processes, uh, presumably on larger systems, but just high traffic ones, uh, you know, you start to have to think about wraparound and is that going to be an issue? Like, you know, if, if everything was vacuuming very quickly, it's not an issue. Uh, but if you are burning through, you know, the XID limits within your 2 billion within the five day time, or imagine you do, do it like once a week, like that's pretty common. I've seen that uh, for these types of databases. Like once a week, we'll, we'll have gone through you know the whole XID space. So if you do, if you have a five day auto vacuum, like you, you know, and you kill it after two days, like you might get done in time, but you might not get done in time. So you know how much of a concern is that? Uh, or actually, really, what probably is more likely to happen is you hit the auto vacuum for wraparound situation, right, where it's kicking off for wraparound purposes as opposed to just doing regular cleanup from file system deletes and that kind of thing. Um, so, and that was one of the things that I had mentioned. So the, the discussion goes on a little bit more about, um, you know, is the vacuum running and what's the purpose of it? And the thing that I mentioned, and I, and I think this is an important thing that kind of got overlooked in the discussion, so I kind of mentioned it at the end, was if you're killing your auto vacuums because of wraparound concerns, right? Like they're, they're uh, in these really high traffic systems, one of the problems is certainly as, companies have adopted sort of this, you know, DevOps style workflow uh, that you're doing things like more schema pushes out into production, right? It's not just a, a busy database from the sense of transactional load, but it's also, you know, somewhat rapidly evolving uh, and to the point where you don't want vacuums getting in the way of DDL changes and that type of thing. Uh, and auto vacuum for wraparound can really cause some trouble with that. Um, as your DDL can can get, you know, backed up behind the auto vacuums, um, and so I mentioned, like, you know, if you're if you're killing auto vacuum because of a wraparound concern, uh, and you want to do a manual vacuum, um, actually, the way you should do that is, if you kill that auto vacuum, run a manual vacuum with index cleanup off. Uh, that will have it kind of bypass the whole. We got to scan the indexes multiple times especially on these multi-terabyte tables. Uh, when you see these multi-day auto vacuums, in most cases that I have seen, like that is not from scanning the heap. It is definitely from scanning indexes and possibly doing multiple index passes uh, that really, really gets at you. So that, that can be a real pain. Um, if you do the manual vacuum with index cleanup off, it skips that scanning, which is good enough for recovering the XID space, right? And getting you away from having to deal with that. Now, I would also generally bump up the autovac freeze limit uh, as a matter of course. I've pretty much always done that, you know, for 15 plus years now uh, since I started running into it as a, an issue on uh, busy enough databases. Um, that's one that I just by default would, would push that up. 
but either way, like doing the vacuum manually with index cleanup off, that it's one of the reasons why it's such a huge thing to be able to do that. Uh, and in, I think in 15 or 16, certainly in 16, auto vacuum will actually do that itself if it's doing one for wraparound. So, um, but the thing is like, again, remember if you're, if you're doing like a five day cycle on your auto vacuum and you know, your XID space only can take you about seven days. The problem is that if you kill it on day one and then you run it the next day, you may not be in an auto vacuum for wraparound, right? You're, it's your regular vacuum that's still going, that's pushing you towards the edge. If you do it on day two, like you may make it or not, right? You're back in that scenario and you're not in an auto vacuum for wraparound at that point, right? But you know one will come potentially. So again, just something to be aware of. Uh, that index cleanup off thing can be a lifesaver and it basically resets your space, uh, you know, the amount of time that you will have before you're going to, bump up against those limits again and then you can start that over um i would say you know to me like that's again one of the things i don't see people talk about and and if you're a dba and you're working on postgres systems that are you know busy let's start with that but large also um measuring how long it takes to actually go through both you know between zero and your auto vac freeze limit um you need to know how long that takes on your system and you need to know how long it goes through, you know, it'll take to get you through the 4 billion space uh, overall before you would have wraparound. So um, both of those are like sort of key metrics and pieces of knowledge that you need to know. I don't see many people talking about actually managing that. Please manage that. Please pay attention to that um, and and figure out, you know, and, and it, it's not always easy to figure out how long that takes. Um, but you can, uh, you know, certain tools are make that easier than other ones. Um, and, and so just, you know, again, another tip there. Um, anyways, so, uh, we'll go on to the third question. Uh, like I said, I just kind of want to keep this brief. Um, but this sort of goes back to that same problem, uh, of the index cleanup bit. So, uh, the original question is, uh, from someone named Gary, I'm not even sure which like team this was on, um, but they say, hey, everybody, uh, could someone help me understand the difference between the following columns? And he's looking in PGStat progress uh, and looking at PGStat progress vacuum primarily, and he's got max dead tuples, uh, num dead tuples, but then also looking at PGStat all tables, there's a column in there called n dead tup, right? Uh, and so like, how do these things relate to each other? Uh, and how do they, in particular, um, he says, I'm a bit confused as to what the other values represent. Uh, and are they represented as the amount of dead tuples that can fit into the maintenance work mem or something else? Right. The inter So he's really getting at what is the interplay between these fields? Can I look at these fields and make, uh, you know, smart choices and decisions about what I should be doing on maintenance work mem? And so the, the problem is, um, you know, they're, they're, I would say self-explanatory until you try to reason about them. And then, then you can kind of get lost a little bit. Um, uh, the two in PG stat progress. So the first one is max dead tuples that can fit into your maintenance work mem. Uh, the second is the current number of dead tuples within the current vacuum phase. So if you're watching that as the vacuum is progressing, you should see, you know, the num dead tuples increasing towards the max dead tuples, but you will see it pause right, as it's doing like index sweeps and going through the other phases, uh, you know, as it's making pro, it'll pause and then it'll do index sweeps and then it'll come back and then it'll start to go again. Uh, and then the third one is sort of number estimated dead tuples. That's the one from PG stat, all tables. So the two that we really care about are the ones in the progress vacuum. But the thing that, that I think really throws people, uh, and it's not obvious. So if you say the, the max dead tuples, uh, and I said, that's the number of tuples that can fit into your maintenance work mem. And what happens is people say, okay, well, I'll boost my maintenance work mem, like really large. And they'll do this, you know, for indexes or whatever. If you have like a terabyte table and you know, building an index on that thing is going to be, you know, dozens, if not hundreds of gigabytes, uh, people will definitely, you know, and you're running on 512 terabyte mem of memory or whatever, you know, whatever, like you've got these big Hong Kong systems, people will boost that up. Uh, and usually they boost maintenance workmen up for, you know, I would say indexes primarily, and then maybe like clusters or something like that. Um, but really for index building. Uh, but the other half of maintenance workmen is one of these config settings that's really overloaded, right? It does double duty. One for the maintenance tasks, vacuum, you know, index building and whatnot, but also for 
doing vacuums. Uh, and the problem is that the way that it does it with vacuums, there's actually a limit in the code uh, that you can't really set it higher than one gigabyte. Uh, and people have looked at actually changing that. It's not an easy, it's not as easy as you would think. Um, because if you take out the hard code, then you need, the idea would be like, what would really be nice, and I've kind of thought about this, and there's a couple of key threads on the mailing list uh, where this has been discussed a few years ago, I think was the last time it really came up. Uh, you'd really like some kind of dynamic allocation that could go, and I've got some theories on maybe ways that you can make that work. Uh, but TLDR, we don't have it now, and it's not really being worked on, um, unfortunately. Uh, so there's a, there's a maximum amount it's basically hard coded in uh, to Postgres, right? So even if you set yours to like 20 gigs, you're actually going to be limited to about a gig, right? And on these really large tables, um, what you will find, uh, there's an actual number and I don't remember it off the top of my head, but it's like, uh, I want to say it's like 170 million uh, CTIDs will fit into that maintenance work mem. So if your vacuums, right, uh, if, if your vacuums need more than 170 million rows to clean up, right, uh, updates uh, or deletes or inserts or whatever, right, if it's cleaning up more than 170 million CTIDs, and that sounds like a lot. I know it sounds like a lot. Um, but again, like if you're doing, you know, terabyte-sized tables that, that may have billions of rows and whatnot, um, then you will surprisingly run out of that space. Uh, and the reason it's such a problem on these large tables, uh, and this goes back to the previous question of doing the index cleanup. So when vacuum is running, it goes through multiple phases. Uh, and sort of the key ones for this problem, uh, it scans the heap, collecting up the C tits and saying, okay, here's all the rows that I need to clean up and I need to deal with. And then it has to go and look in the indexes and, and deal with it over there. Uh, and so if you're, if you, let's say you have 200 million, right? Uh, or let's say 175 million C tits. Uh, are in there. And that might be, you know, 10% of your table. If you set your scale factor right for vacuums like at like 10%, that's a pretty common setting. You've got 2 billion rows in the table, maybe 200 million rows uh, actually getting inserted or updated before that thing kicks off. Well, now what happens is it scans the heap. That might even be relatively quick. But then if you've got a bunch of indexes on that thing, it has to go scan all of those indexes and it's going to have to do that more than once. Right? And that's why I say like, a lot of that time in these really large tables and these really large vacuums, most of that time, honestly, is spent in doing these index scans. Uh, and then it'll come back and say, okay, cleaned up all the indexes for the first 170 million. Let me do the last like 5 million, right? And it's just, it, it's such a long time because it's got to scan the index again. It, it can't just pick up where it left off in that scenario. And that's what really is frustrating about that. Uh, and it just takes so long on these really big tables. So index cleanup off, uh, Peter Gagan, you know, uh, my, my all props and, and whatever he implemented that, uh, was kind of the main person behind that, I believe, um, to get index cleanup off as a feature. Uh, so for wraparound purposes, you can run it without index cleanup. And then you do have to eventually like take the pain, um, you know, and that's why I was like, I, man, I would love, on many of these systems, you've got RAM to spare, right? Like from one gig to two gig. There are issues with just blanketly raising it up, which is why that hasn't been done. Like I said, there's some mailing list threads on the topic. Um, uh, I, I would be very tempted uh, if I, you know, worked at one of these cloud providers and uh, I could just magically double that thing to two gigs. I would be really tempted to just say, well, you know, for our customers, we're gonna bump that thing to two gigs. You have to do it at the source code level. So that's, you know, why maybe you don't want to. Um, but anyways, so keep that in mind. If you're on these tables where you know you've got high, uh, you know, dead tuple churn and, and like I said, 175 million plus uh, rows are getting done within your vacuum cycles, um, just be aware that, that that's, you know, there's sort of a hard limit there. Uh, and cranking up maintenance workmen past that one gigabyte mark really isn't going to help you much. So, um so sort of the third thing, just sort of pointed that out to him. Uh, you know, that could be an argument for maybe introducing like partitioning or something along those lines. Um, it's a little bit unfortunate because uh, in a lot of cases you wouldn't need it otherwise. Um, but because of the hard limit, you know, hey, that is what it is. So, uh, so that, there you go. Three questions in and around the topic of vacuuming. Uh, it's a, you know, 
I feel like for most people, this is really not an issue, but when it becomes an issue, it's almost like an existential crisis. Uh, and so I understand why it's a hot topic. Uh, and like I said, I still think that there's some stuff we need to do in the Postgres community to, to make that process better understood. Um, if you're a DBA and you're trying to manage that stuff. So hopefully this has all been useful. Uh, if you've given me all the time, uh, appreciate it. I will be back out on the road a bit this fall, uh, going to a few different conferences. I'll probably drop some notices on LinkedIn just to let folks know where I'm going to be. If you found this useful, if you'd like to hear, uh, you know, me go on about other problems I've had with Postgres, uh, if you've got questions you'd like answered, uh, with, it's like and subscribe or, you know, drop a comment or whatever, or come find me on Slack, let me know, uh, and I'd be happy to answer more questions. That's kind of what to do. So, um, that's it for now, and hopefully I'll see you uh, out there on the road someplace. Thanks.